it's very pleasant to be here today with all of you. Uh, I'm from Taiwan and my name is Li Ting. I'm now studying, um, I just finished my master in the Netherlands. I'm going to become a PhD student in three months. So um, today I would like to share about um, some stories of myself and my study during the past half year and some interesting small tricks with Python that I really liked. And I hope that you will have fun as I do. And if there's any question, you can interrupt during the presentation or save them in the end. We can talk about it. So here we go. Um, the topic is Python's role in accelerating biomedical sciences. And as I just said, who am I? I was born in Taiwan, raised in Taiwan, and went to the Netherlands since 2017 until now. And it's my pleasure to come here again. And thanks for the Python <laughs> Philippines for some financial aid that made it, this trip possible. And as you can see here, I flew to the Netherlands just to explore the world to see what is different. And then I encountered a guy called Gaudo van Drossum, if you know him. He is the founder of, uh, he's the author of Python. And this was actually a joke. I didn't encounter him, but I just realized that he's also a Dutch. So it's interesting to know that I also start to learn about Python in Netherlands. And then my background was veterinary medicine. So I was always in love with animals. And then I want to solve their diseases. And during the way of my studying, I also worked in a clinic. But then, but then I realized that there are still a lot of diseases that we cannot solve and we don't even know why. And therefore, that's why I went for the uh, master in the Netherlands. And then during my study, I started to learn that informatics are a bit more stable and more reliable comparing to experiments. And therefore, I gradually turned into the, this field to join you guys. And so I have one year of coding experience. So if I just show something like, just like, you want to show this to me? Then just forgive me. I, I just feel they are interesting and amazing. Uh, so a bit of uh, my expertise. Uh, biomedical science is a study of complexity. It's from a human being. It can be separated into many organs. And in each organ, there are many cells that, that uh, contribute to this diversity. And I don't know how much do you know about bi biology, but every cell in your, cell, in your body they have a similar, similar genome, which is composed of DNA. I hope in this level is still okay to understand, right? And then I, in the beginning, I, I submitted the title as Biomedical Sciences, but then I realized that maybe there's just too complex to, to describe all these levels. So then I, realized, uh, I, I decided to focus only on this first level, which is more like the zero one um, world in this room. So this is the real focus of this, uh, this talk today. So the Python's role in genomics. And what is genome? Uh, the outline of today's talk will be, first we'll talk about what is genomics, and the second, why would you care about genomics? And the third is about my project, which is related to cancer evolution. And the end, uh, uh, conclusion and sharing of ideas. So um, firstly, as I just said, genome is the code of life. And genome is composed of DNAs in humans. And DNA is a double-stranded uh, nucleic acid that has A, T, G, C, four different bases. And there are two, two pairs of three billion base pairs in a human cells. And there's around um, 10 to the nine um, numbers of cells in your body. 
and above the ATGC, there are also epigenetics. So there is a lot of information in ourselves, but we don't realize it until like the recent 10 years or even five years. And why is, um, and yeah, this is just a brief review about high school biology. So why, why is there two pairs? Why is two times three billion base pairs? Because one of them is from your father's sperm and the other is from your mother's egg. And then when they combine, and then this is the first cell in your body, and then it expands to all the cells in your body. And during this expanding, there could be mutations introduced, like noise, during the um, expansion. And usually those noise wouldn't cause any effect on the function of the cells. But if the mutation hits on a gene that is crucial, then with the accumulation of these mutations, then it could cause diseases such as cancer. Um, and this you can keep in mind because I will talk about it later. And these mutations are also like um, just arrows in the, in the data. And that is what we want to look for, like differences in, the, in the, all the cells in your body. Um, and this is, as I just said, that every one of us has a large amount of data with us, but we don't realize. And how come we cannot realize? It's because that before it was not possible to know. So from 1995, people start to try to sequence the whole genome of a human cell, and it took them 10 years. So until 2004, there's first genome human genome being sequenced. Just as I mentioned, there's like six billion base pairs, so it takes some time for the technical issue and then for the data storage and stuff. And then after three years, there's a second human genome being developed. And you can see on the left, there's a, the US dollar cost for sequencing a human genome, which is kind of hard to imagine how much is it. But then it dropped to around 200 euro, uh, 200 US dollar for now, so that it's actually pretty doable. If you want to know your whole genome, you just there's also companies starting with this that you can just send your like saliva to them, and then you can know your genetic background and stuff. And why is this important? As as you, many of you might be data scientists. I don't know how, how many. Can you raise your hand? Yeah. OK, great. So this is about data. So every one of us has a large amount of data in ourselves. And if possible, people can use your data to earn money from you. And so uh, there's a blog post on Medium, uh, Neo Live uh, blog. They said about, so the DNA information could be the next, next Google, kind of, that they know your information. They can even not charge you for sequencing your genome. But using your genome, they can give you things you prefer and then things you need based on your genetics and your health. And this is a bit scary, and it's not happening yet, but it's, it's expected to be happen very soon. And actually, there are, so there are already many companies trying to build up this network or this database. And Google has, um, like a Google Cloud has a specific team. They are working on this data storage and how do you analyze using their tools. And there's also another company called DNA Nexus. They also provide services for nowadays for research but in the future. Who knows, maybe it's for commercials. And this 23andMe is a, the biggest company for normal individuals that if, if you want to know your genome, then you can do what I said, just send your saliva and they, they tell you that uh, your ancestors is, is actually Dutch or something like that. But yeah, this field is going on. So that's why today I'm here to share a little bit about it. and. Uh, I think that in the future that it, this will be a, a growing industry that might require more 
um, human power to work on it. Okay, and now it's my project, and this part will be a little bit less surprising, I guess, but bear with me. So uh, my project is about tumor evolution. And tumor, I don't know if you know that tumor looks like a blump, sometimes looks like a blump in your body. They just grow uncontrollably. But um, it actually, it's not just a cell that expands forever, but it's a, a group of cells having different characteristics. So it looks like this in color. They just cover color different cells, uh, cells with different gene different genome into different color, like this. And in the past, it's not possible to sequence each single cell. You take the whole tumor and then send it to sequencing, and you got a mixture of all the cells in there. And then how do you know the diversity in the tumor is not possible? And people try to deconvolve the percentage of the mutation to try to know the diversity and the population ratio. But um, it is not ideal. But nowadays, in, in, this, in around 2010, they're starting, there is a new technique starting called the single cell sequencing. So with that, it's possible to sequence one single cell with only two strands of DNA, you amplify them and then sequence. So with that, you can get each single cells you acquire from this tumor and then use the difference between these cells to build a mutation tree from it. So this is a part of my, uh, this is my project and in a, I'm a part of this project. And yeah, as I said. Yeah, so in this project, there are 4,000 single cells we sequenced. And as, as you remember, there's 6 billion base pair in each cell, which is a lot. But things are not so ideal with the tech, technical issues, so that you still lost a lot when you sequence it. So you're trying to match different, different pictures with only peeking to small small corners of each picture and then try to compare them to each other. So that's what I did. And to have a little idea about how much does it cost, it's around this. And it's about like, yeah, so um, biomedical study are very expensive. And this kind of research is not for everyone. So but um, yeah, I guess there is some potential in this field, therefore the government um, is willing to. Yeah, but it's because like in every industry is the same, then when, when it's in the beginning of the, of the science, then it always costs a lot and you don't see any re like response. And then when it really reach a, a certain point and you, you start to see why are we doing these. Yeah, so this research we're going to understand what happened in the genome during the cancer evolution. Yeah, so why am I here? <laughs> After such a long introduction, uh, this is what, uh, what related to Python. So these modules are what I have been using in the past six months in this project. And I will show some cases of like visualization or um, yeah, mainly visualization of my result of these sequencing. And then, um, yeah, so those are involved. These, these modules are involved in the plot. Yeah, so just a refresh that Somatic mutations are genetic markers turning the replication of cells. And there are three different markers we used in this study, which is single nucleotide variants, copy number variants, and viral introduced unique barcodes. And as I mentioned earlier, that these um, 
the whole genome sequence in, in each single cells are not complete. So we have to use one or the other um, genetic markers to try to build the whole puzzle. Yeah, and this is the sparsity of the data you can see here, built by Seabone uh, cluster map, if you can see, uh, heap map, if you can think of. Um, so these three are the three different markers we had sequenced in the experiment. And the white part is that we don't have data, and black is that we have data. So this is the first plot, first, first, of the 10 plots I, I made in my, in my internship. And you can see that it's really, really for the help for the community that who built Seaborn to make this desk so easy. So I really, I'm really thankful for everyone's here today. Um, and the second here, you can see that this is the sparsity of the input data. This plot is focusing on the SMV, which is one of the aspects I'm working on. And you can see that in the blue dots is the position that the cells doesn't have the mutation. And the red dots are the cells that has it. So there's like 3,000 different cells on accesses, and then 600 sites that we selected for looking for mutations. But the mutations are really sparse. You cannot even see them, I guess. But if I focus on the small plots, and you can see that some cells on the axis, they have the same mutation, which will appear on the, as a red line on this plot. So those are the signals that we want to pick up from this matrix. And the workflow for this study is as follow. So first, you have a very sparse matrix, as I showed here. It's on, only 2.2% field, and the rest are just empty. So first, you have a sparse matrix, and then we use a random forest classifier to um, detect if two SMVs has orders in the mutation tree. So if one appear before the other, then you will see in the data is that always, when the other one is zero, then the second one has to be zero as well. So with this, um, we simulated a mutation tree that has internal noise, then using this simulated tree to train the random forest and then test on the real data. So with the random forest classifier, you can get a score for each link to be real ordered SMVs. And then we use this order to impute the original data frame because of the order, and then do it again. So this is an iterative process. And until that we cannot fill the metrics anymore, we use the pairwise order that is detected in the random forest to build a network. And this network, we extract a mutation tree from it. So this is the result that we got. Uh, initial data input that it might look a bit um, scary in the first sight, but I will wor work through it part by part and then describe what I did in there. So here in the middle, you can see there are green and pink parts, which is the distance between the cells. So this is a cell-to-cell -cell matrix. And if two cells have a dark green distance, that means these two cells have very similar genomic profile. And if they are very different, then it will be pink. So in the middle, this is the distance matrix. But how do you build a distance matrix from sparse data? If you are working with data, then you know it can be a difficult problem. There are not so much available algorithm to calculate sparse data. So we developed an algorithm to calculate the sparse data. 
And what Python did in here is that it's really um, a natural language so that you can easily convert the math algorithm into Python code. So which is really great, I think. So we, we tra transfer this idea that we want to use into these lines of code. So it's not even to 100 lines. Um, so in the first part, we calculate the probability of seeing a zero or seeing a one in the, in the distance in, in each of these positions. And then using this probability, you know if it's always a one, then you are not surprised to see they are both one. So the distance wouldn't, it wouldn't have a big effect on the distance. However, if there's like um, only 1% of ones and the rest are all zero, then when you compare these two cells, then you know that, oh, it's very rare, um, rare mutation, then this distance between these two cells will be pushed apart. So it depends on the priors. And yeah, and then the distance is normalized in the end by the presence of all the SMVs. Yeah, so this is the middle part you see. And then next we want to, I want to talk about this color bar you see on the left. So first we calculate the uh, cell distance based on SMV, which is one feature of the genome. And then we compare it to other features we have in the data, which is the cell barcode, cell viral barcode, and the copy number state. I know it's a, some, a lot of terms, and they are just three, you can just think of they are three different features in the, each single cells. So we compare one feature to two other features on this axis, and also the labels of them, like what time they are sequenced, or what replicate they are in. And if you are also amazed by how, how do you plot this, then that's what I'm going to show. <laughs> yeah, so usually if you check on the Seaborn cluster map documentation, it will say that row color, you can assign a row color to it. But how, how do you do that? In the documentation, there's no, no way to, sh there's only one line in the example, which just put one um, uh, lookup table into it. But how do you compose a, a row colors with four different layer of information next to each other? That's actually a trick to do it, but it doesn't say it's on the documentation. So, uh, after this period of learning, I just learned that everything, I just go on Stack Overflow and then check if there's any other. <laughs> yeah, so Stack Overflow has some information that just deep in and then if you know what to look for, then you somehow can com come up with something that is not show anywhere else. Yeah, so here we can actually input a data frame into the row colors. And if you put this data frame into it, with every cell with a, a, so every feature you have a color according to the feature, then it automatically calculates this for you. And the code is here, but I can imagine that you cannot really see it. So yeah, the trick is, yeah, maybe just come to me after the talk. Yeah, and then here is the code for the uh, random forest training. And it's also a small trick that I learned during the process of doing this project, which is um, when you are training for a random forest, sometimes the, um, the input data can be really enormous. And if you want to have all of the data at once, on your RAM or something, I'm not sure, then it could be too difficult for the computer. But for training the random forest, you actually can put the data in 
batch by batch. So you can turn this uh, warm start to true, and then remember that an estimator has to has to be increased every time when you put in new data, then it will work. But um, it's also a small trick because when you read on the documentation, it says just set the warm start to true, then you are good to go, but it's not true. So yeah, a lot of try and error. Yeah, and the last one I want to show is that how, how do we combine different modules to plot something that are different from the others? So here you see on the left is a um, mutation tree we built from Network X with the algorithm we just talked about. And you can see that on each node, you can see the, the name of the node. And on each edges, you can see the weight of the edges. But there's nothing, not much more you can put on it. And if you put more data in there, it just looks ugly. But we want to compare different layer of data, right? As we said in the beginning, there is like copy number and SMV and viral barcode. So that um, when you really look into it and try to combine them, uh, this is what I come up with. So the pie chart it is representing of the copy number variants. Different color is a different color. A uh, different color is a different copy number variant. And so in each node, you can see that the connections are SMV, but on the node, you can see the copy number. And you see that, you, for example, in this mutation, there's many different copy number in the beginning, but then when it branches to diff more mutations, then it only restrict to, restricted to one copy number. Which, which means that these two uh, features are uh, compatible with each other. And also like different copy number are showing different SMVs, so which we're also expecting this result. And moreover, other than the pie chart ratio you can see here, we can also plot the size of the cells with this, with this uh, mutation. So the pie chart, when the pie chart is bigger, then it's more cells in it. And when it's smaller, then it's less cells. So I'm super proud of this plot. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And um, if, yeah, if you want to know more detail, it's also here. That you can also come to me afterward. So uh, basically, you just store the data in the network X. So each node has multiple data, like you have the cell count of this mutation or the copy number count. And then you just use a, um, you just convert all these um, information to matplot library and then plot them as patches to these coordinates. And then in the end you will get it. Yeah, so to wrap up, uh, why is Python so important in my work? So the first one is that it has really easily apply, applicable machine learning modules that even like a newbie like me can use it. And the second is that it's natural language, so it's easy to implement mathematic com concepts into like words and it actually worked. And then the third one is that it's really a powerful visualization tool. And lastly, um, uh, a lot of um, modules or uh, applications, like for finding the variants or, yeah, like bio biomedical tools, they provide a Python API, so you can use Python to uh, communicate with them. Yeah, so to sum up, uh, various module in Python can help us to understand complex and multi layers of information in genomics. And in conclusion, um, I, I really like this experience that 
I had my domain knowledge in biology, and then I started with informatics with the help of Python, that I got something out of it in a short time. And the second, that is an idea I want to bring today, is that um, the age of genomics, it might be coming soon. And you can think about how do you want your data to be stored for, by them, and how can you protect yourself from this coming, stealing personal data of age? Um, yeah, and research for health is for everyone. So is, if you are also interested in contributing to um, biomedical sciences, just code. <laughs> then we can use your module. <laughs> and thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, you can ask or go on Stack Overflow. We'll take, we'll take questions now. Anybody questions? Anybody has questions for, yeah. Say your name and then just your question. All right, so my name is Joey. Um, just a quick question in the data that you used uh, for your, your project. Yeah. Did you use um, a human cell or animal type of cell? And yes. is there a difference between those? Yeah, so in this study, it is human cells. And I didn't go into details, but they are uh, normal human gut cell, like colon cells. And colons are an organ that frequently have cancer. And in the previous experiment, they um, introduced several genes that are often seen in colon cancer into these healthy colon cells. And then they see the same development of cancer cell, cancer features in these cells. So we use these cells, which is from human, but culture in the lab. We use them to to um, do this uh, cancer evolution experiment. And the cells are cultured in the type called organoids, and they are not sing They are not. Um, yeah. So in the past. Cells are cultured on a plate that is like growing like flat. And people have found out that um, cells are not so much like they were if they are cultured in this type of setting. But nowadays, um, there's a new technique called organoids that it was developed. And the cells culture are growing like in balls, like a hollow, hollow balls that simulated uh, the, the tubular structure in our gut. And this is the model we used. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Yeah. Hello. Sorry, I didn't really understand. Very good presentation, by the way. Uh, I didn't really understand how you filled in the sparse. So we fill in the sparse data by detecting the order of SMVs which is if I, see, if I see two SMV, one is always present with the other one, then we know that one is later, one is earlier. Um, yeah, so there's like an ordering between all the SMV pairs. But it is not so straightforward because there's also noise introduced into this data. So sometimes you can see that there's like the other way around. But um, but it's hard to detect with our like logical thinking how many of them uh, like how many of them is wrong then it's wrong it's not a real pair or it is just noise so we used this uh, idea but sim simulated a real real set uh, simulated a real tree with arrows. And then use this tree to train the model. So we have a real tree that is ground truth because it's simulated and it has arrows in it. So in each SMV pairs, there's still 
we can still calculate um, the real order, but there's noise. So we know that how many noise level it is possibly to be a true order, and then what is not. Yeah, so we use this as a ground truth to, to train the random forest. Yeah. Wow, you got that? <laughs> she said it was not straightforward, and then she explained, and I was like, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you guys can even have a uh, more deeper conversation after. But any other question? Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Jeff. Um, based on my little understanding of biology, um, I, uh, I can confirm that, that your study is more, or it can be able to trace um, somatic mutations on DNA or cells. Um, do you think that given this study, you can be able to trace um, if a specific healthy cell would be able to mutate and might cause cancer in a short period of time, for example? Yeah, so uh, when a cell become, how, how does a cell become a cancer cell? It actually requires multiple um, genes being dis destroyed or disturbed. Um, uh, in this experiment, we, will, we are testing already, we are looking at already uh, can cancerous cells. So in this study, it's not possible to see how fast can a single can a normal cell become a, a mutation cell because these mutations are introduced uh, artificially. But of course, there there will be other studies. They uh, just observe how how are mutation being introduced and how how long does it take to develop cancer. Um, and as far as I know, because cancer is always related with age. And in human, it actually really take up some time to build up the prerequisite for a cancer to develop. So I guess some long time, yeah. Okay, so we have another question here and then I can take one more, okay? I just wanna ask if uh, your Python codes uh, all, all the Python codes that you've written, is it open Is it open source? Is it available in GitHub so we can it check it out? It is not available now, but oh, yeah. we would like to. And um, you can contact me after the talk because currently the uh, paper is still under drafting and we want to publish it. So um, yeah, it's not open source for at the moment. Other question, one more? Okay, I'll take both of you. Okay. Um, you said that the future would be about uh, genomics. So what would be the bright side of this future? What can we imagine as the benefits if we have this kind of technology in the future? Yeah, I actually think that there's a lot of benefit in predicting diseases. So as you might know that around your family, there's some diseases going on that it's just more frequent in your family. And it's not just by chance, it is in our code. But we don't see it now. And if the genomic sequencing is becoming cheaper and cheaper to the point that we are, uh, we are allowed to know a bit more about ourselves, which is not happening yet, then we can take some preventive measurements as well. But at this, in this process that to be cautious about is that do we want them to know so much about us? For example, like the 23andMe I mentioned, it's one available product now, but they, they will write in the description that your data is theirs. You get what you want to know, but your, whole, your data is theirs, and they can sell it to others. So it is something that to be cautious about, but of course there are a lot of benefits to know more. Thank you. Our last question here. Yeah, uh, interesting stuff. Um, so my limited experience with big data and analytics is that a whole lot of your time is spent just getting the data into a format that you can start using it and processing it. Can you tell us a little bit more about the tech stack that you had, like what databases you used to store this data and what the size of the data that you were dealing with? Um, yeah, so in a, a human, a, a whole genome, Sequence is around 
four gigabytes. And if we have 4,000 cells, then it's a little bit to the terabyte um, level. And uh, the file format, now I'm blank, so <laughs> I have to think about that. <laughs> but it's like more like a text uh, format, yeah. So there's no database there, but a text format, like a single file, is what you um, mean? No. Uh, So there, there is a, oh, yeah, I have to look into the file type name. But so we have, because we have multiple layer of data. So for example, the cell has labels and the labels will be st stored in data frame. But the row, the row variant will be stored in a more binary type and then we, what I, what I, um, what you see the, on the plots here, it is based on pandas data frame. But before that, there was many steps of processing of locating the correct base, and then we store this base only into this data frame. Yeah, is it clear? Yeah.